and Wanda wandered disconsolately to the one person who always seemed glad to see her, the one person she could always count on. That was Hugo Amaril. It was six years ago that she had wandered into Hugo's office. Hugo looked up at her with his owlish, reconstituted eyes, and, as usual, took a moment or two to recognize her. Why, it's my dear friend, Wanda. Why do you look so sad? Wanda's lower lip trembled. Nobody loves me. Oh, come, that's not true. They just love that new baby. They don't care about me any more. I love you, Wanda. Well, you're the only one then, Uncle Hugo. She cradled her head on his shoulder and wept. Amaral, totally unaware of what he should do, could only hug the girl and say, Don't cry. Don't cry and out of sheer sympathy he found that tears were trickling down his own cheeks as well. And then he said with sudden energy, Wanda, would you like to see something pretty? What? Amaral knew only one thing in life and the universe that was pretty. Did you ever see the prime radiant? No. What is it? It's what your grandfather and I use to do our work. See? It's right here. He pointed to the black cube on his desk, and Wanda looked at it woefully. That's not pretty. Not now, agreed Amaral. But watch when I turn it on. He did so. The room darkened and filled with dots of light and flashes of color. See? Now we can magnify it so all the dots become mathematical symbols. And so they did. There in the air were signs of all sorts, letters, numbers, arrows, and shapes that Wanda had never seen before. Isn't it pretty? asked Amaro. Yes, it is. Wanda stared carefully at the equations that represented possible futures. I don't like that part, though. I think it's wrong. She pointed at a colorful equation to her left. Wrong? Why do you say it's wrong? Amaral frowned. Because it's not pretty. I do it a different way. Amaral cleared his throat. Well, well, I'll try to fix it up. And he moved closer to the equation in question, staring at it in his owlish fashion. Thank you very much, Uncle Hugo, for showing me your pretty lights. Maybe someday I'll understand what they mean. That's all right. I hope you feel better. A little, thanks. And after flashing the briefest of smiles, Wanda left the room. Amaral stood there, feeling a trifle hurt. He didn't like having the Prime Radiance product criticized, not even by a 12-year-old girl. And as he stood there, he had no idea whatsoever that the psychohistorical revolution had begun. That afternoon, Amaral went to Harry Selden's office at Streeling University. Amaral looked puzzled. Harry, something very odd has happened. Very peculiar. Selden looked at his friend with deepest sorrow. Amaral was only 53, but he looked much older, worn down to almost transparency. What is it, Hugo? It was Wanda. She came in to see me, very sad very upset. Why? Apparently, it's the new baby. Oh, yes. Harry had more than a trace of guilt in his voice. I thought I'd cheer her up by showing her the prime radiant. Here, Amaral hesitated. Gone, you go. What happened? Well, she stared at all the lights, and I magnified a portion, and Wanda pointed to a part of it, and said it was no good. It wasn't pretty. We all have our personal likes and dislikes. Yes, of course. But I spent some time going over it, and Harry, there was something wrong with it. But that's impossible. It was just coincidence. Was it? Do you think, with all your knowledge of psychohistory, you could take one glance at a new set of equations and tell me that one portion is no good. For a few moments, Selden was lost in thought. Then he asked the question 
that pushed forward the psycho-historical revolution that Wanda had begun. Hugo, did you have any suspicions about those equations beforehand? Well, I know I did. When I was setting it up, it's a new section, you know. I remember thinking it looked wrong, but I had other things to do, and I just let it go. And you turned on that very fragment of the equations to show Wanda, as though it were haunting your unconscious mind. Amaral shrugged. Who knows? I think I know what happened, Yuko. Wanda read your mind. Amaral jumped. That's impossible. I can't believe it. I can, but I don't know what to do about it. Dimly, Selden felt the rumblings of a revolution in psychohistorical research, but only dimly. Like any intellectual, Harry Selden had made use of the Galactic Library freely. After the revelation of Wanda's unique gift, he had worked on a plan to find others like Wanda, during which time he had kept a private office at the library so he could have ready access to its vast collection of data. He had even rented a small apartment in an adjacent sector under the dome so that he would be able to walk to the library when his ever-increasing research prevented him from returning to the Streeling sector. He had been working for about two years when his plan took on new dimensions, and he had wanted to meet Lass Zenau. It was not easy to set up a personal interview with the chief librarian of the Galactic Library, but despite the fact that they had never met before, Selden had no trouble arranging a meeting. Zenau knew him well. An honor, First Minister, Selden smiled. I trust you know that I have not held that post in sixteen years. The honor of the title is still yours. And now tell me, what can I do for you? Chief Librarian, I have not come to ask anything easy of you. What I want is more space at the library. I want permission to bring in a number of my associates. I want permission to undertake a long and elaborate program of the greatest importance. Last Zena's face drew into an expression of distress. You ask a great deal. Can you explain the importance of all this? Yes. The Empire is in the process of disintegration. There was a long pause. Then Zenau said, How will your increased presence here prevent that? It won't. But the project I am interested in will. I want to create a great encyclopedia, containing within it all the knowledge humanity will need to rebuild itself in case the worst happens. An Encyclopedia Galactica, if you will. And if it, too, is destroyed? I hope it will not be. It is my intention to find a world far away on the outskirts of the galaxy, one where I can transfer my encyclopedists and where they can work in peace. Until such a place is found, however, I want the nucleus of the group to work here. See now, grimaced. I see your point, Professor Selden, but I'm not sure that it can be done. Why not, Chief Librarian? Because being Chief Librarian does not make me an absolute monarch. I have a rather large board, and please don't think that I can just push your encyclopedia project through. I'm astonished. Don't be. I am not a popular Chief Librarian, the board has been fighting for some years now for limited access to the library. I have resisted. It galls them that I have afforded you your small office space. Appropriations to the library have been cut several times, and we simply don't have the funds we used to have, Selden said desperately. What if I can find credits for you? Indeed? How? What if I talk to the emperor? I was once first minister. He'll see me, and he'll listen to me. See now thought for a moment. I'm willing to let you try. Selden left Zenau in a mood of unease. Everything he had told the chief librarian was true and trivial. The real reason he needed the use of the library remained hidden. This was partly because 
he didn't yet see that use clearly himself. That was also the year that Harry Selden found himself sitting at Hugo Amaral's bedside, patiently, sadly. Hugo was beyond medical help. He was only fifty-five. Amaral's eyes opened. You're still here, Harry. Selden nodded. I won't leave you till I die. Yes. Then in an outburst of grief, he said, Why have you done this, Hugo? If you had lived sensibly, you could have lived much longer. Amaral smiled faintly. If it hadn't been for me plugging away, psychohistorical advance would have screeched to a halt. Selden nodded. You are right, Hugo. For that I am grateful. And when you spend at least half your time on administrative duties, who does, did, the real work, eh? You, you go, absolutely. His eyes closed again. Emerald's breathing was growing stertorous, and then he moved a little and his eyes opened, staring directly at Harry. What will happen to psychohistory when I'm gone? Have you thought of that? Yes, I have, and I want to speak to you about it. It may please you. Hugo, I believe that psychohistory is being revolutionized. Amaral frowned slightly. In what way? I don't like the sound of that. Now listen, it was your idea. Years ago, you told me that two foundations should be established in isolated and safe locations to serve as nuclei for an eventual second galactic empire. Do you remember? That was your idea. Yes. And do you remember that Wanda was able to read your mind two years ago? Yes, of course. Well, we will find others like Wanda. We will have one foundation that will consist largely of physical scientists who will preserve the knowledge of humanity. And there will be a second foundation of psychohistorians only, mentalists, mind-touching psychohistorians, who will be able to work on psychohistory in a multi-minded way, advancing it far more quickly than individual thinkers ever could. They will serve as a group who will introduce fine adjustments as time goes on, you see. Ever in the background, watching. They will be the Empire's guardians. Wonderful. It's wonderful. You see how I've chosen the right time to die. There's nothing left for me to do. Don't say that, Hugo. Don't make such a fuss over it, Harry. I'm too tired to do anything. Thank you for telling me, his voice was weakening, about the revolution. It makes me happy. 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 And those were Hugo Emerald's last words. Tears stung Selden's eyes and rolled down his cheeks. Another old friend gone. De Merzel, Cleon, Doris, and now Hugo. And the revolution that had allowed Amaral to die happy might never come to pass. Could he manage to make use of the Galactic Library? Could he find more people like Wanda? Most of all, how long would it take? Selden was 66. If only he could have started this revolution at 32 when he first came to Trantor. Now, it might be too late. Harry Selden's audience with the Emperor Aegis XIV was only partly successful. Selden was stunned to learn that the Emperor had no credits of his own and could be of no help to him where the appropriation of credits was concerned. However, the Emperor, persuaded of the necessity of the Encyclopedia Project, suggested that he visit the library with Selden. In Aegis's words, You come with me to the library, and we shall be ostentatiously friendly. I will not ask them for anything. But if they note us walking arm in arm, then perhaps some of that precious board of theirs may feel more kindly to you than otherwise. But 
That's all I can do. Last Zenau said with a certain trace of awe in his voice, I didn't know you were so friendly with the Emperor, Professor Selden. Why not? He's a very democratic fellow for an emperor, and he was interested in my experiences as a first minister in Cleon's time. It made a deep impression on us all. We haven't had an emperor in our halls for many years. Generally, when the emperor needs something from the library, I can imagine, he calls for it and is brought to him as a matter of courtesy. There was once a suggestion, said Zenau chattily, that the emperor be outfitted with a complete set of computerized equipment in his palace, hooked directly into the library system. This was in the old days when credits were plentiful, but, you know, it was voted down. Was it? Oh, yes. Almost the entire board agreed that it would make the emperor too much a part of the library, and that this would threaten our independence from the government. And does this board, which will not bend to an emperor, consent to let me remain at the library? At the present moment, yes. There is a feeling, and I've done my best to encourage it, that if we are not polite to a personal friend of the emperor, the chance of a rise in appropriations will be gone altogether. So, so, credits, or even the dim prospect of credits, talk. I'm afraid so. And... Can I bring in my colleagues? Zina looked embarrassed. I'm afraid not. The emperor was seen walking only with you, not with your colleagues. I'm sorry, Professor. Selden shrugged, and a mood of deep melancholy swept over him. For some time he had hoped to locate others like Wanda, and he had failed. He, too, would need funding to mount an adequate search, and he, too, had nothing. Trantor, the capital, world city of the Galactic Empire, had changed considerably since the day Harry first stepped off the hypership from his native helicon. Was it the pearly haze of an old man's memory that made the Trantor of old shine so brightly in his mind's eye? Harry wondered. Now, Harry thought sadly, the walkways were nearly deserted even in the full light of day. Roving gangs of thugs controlled various areas of the city. A person went out at his own risk, and Harry Selden took that risk in the form of a daily walk, as if defying the forces that were destroying his beloved empire. And so Harry Selden walked along, limping and thoughtful. Wanda's ability to read minds had sharpened considerably in the six years since she had identified the flaw in Hugo Amaral's prime radiant. She had realized that her mental ability set her apart from other people, and she was determined to harness its energy. As she had progressed through her teen years, she had matured, throwing off the girlish giggles that had so endeared her to Harry, at the same time becoming even dearer to him in her determination to help him in his work with the powers of her gift. For Harry Selden had told Wanda about his plan for a second foundation— and she had committed herself to realizing that goal with him. Today, though, Selden was in a dark mood. He was coming to the conclusion that Wanda's mentalic ability would get him nowhere. He still had no credits to continue his work, no credits to locate others like Wanda, no credits to pay his workers on the psychohistory project at Streeling, no credits to set up this all-important encyclopedia project. Now what? He continued to walk toward the Galactic Library. He would have been better off taking a gravic cab, but he wanted to walk. He needed time to think. He heard a cry, There he is, but paid no attention. It came again, There he is, psycho-history. The word forced him to look up. A group of young men was closing in around him. Selden placed his back against the wall and raised his cane. What is it you want? They laughed. Credits, old man. Do you have any credits? What are you going to do if I don't give you any? We'll beat you up, said the leader, and we'll take them. And if I give you my credits, we'll beat you up anyway, they all laughed. Harry Selden raised his cane higher. Stay away, all of you. 
By now, he had managed to count them. There were eight. Selden looked around swiftly. There were no security officers around. Another indication of the deterioration of society. Selden waved his cane. The first one of you who approaches gets a cracked head. Yeah? And the leader stepped forward rapidly and seized the cane, tossing it to one side. Now what, old man? Selden shrunk back. He could only wait for the blows. They crowded around him, each eager to land a blow or two. He tried to avoid them, and his right leg, damaged by sciatica, doubled under him. He fell and knew himself to be utterly helpless. Then he heard a stentorian voice shouting, Get back, you thugs, or I'll kill you all. The leader said, Well, another old man. Not that old, said the newcomer. With the back of one hand, he struck the leader's face, turning it an ugly red. Rage, it's you. Stay out of this, Dad. Just get up and move away. The leader, rubbing his cheek, said, We'll get you for that. No, you won't. Rach drew out two knives, long and gleaming. Selden said weakly, Still carrying knives, Rach. Always. Nothing will ever make me stop. I'll stop you. The leader drew out a blaster. Faster than the eye could follow, one of Rach's knives sailed through the air and struck the leader's throat. He gasped, then fell, while the other seven stared. I want my knife back. Rach drew it out of the hoodlum's throat and picked up his blaster. Rach dropped the blaster into one of his pockets. Get him, shouted one of the hoodlums, and the seven made a concerted rush. Rach took a backward step. One knife flashed, and then the other, and two of the hoodlums were stopped with, in each case, a knife buried in his abdomen. Give me back my knives, Rach pulled each out. That leaves five of you on your feet. Are you going to attack again, or are you going to leave? They turned, and Rach called out, Pick up your dead and dying. I don't want them. Hastily, they flung the three bodies over their shoulders, then they turned tail and ran. Rach bent to pick up Selden's cane. Can you walk, Dad? Not very well. I twisted my leg. Well, then, get into my car. I'll give you a lift back to Streeling. Rach programmed the ground car, then said, What a shame we didn't have doors with us. Selden felt tears stinging his eyelids. I miss her every day. I'm sorry. How did you know I was in trouble? Wanda told me. They were back at Streeling now, and Selden's leg was stretched out on a hassock. Rach looked at him somberly. Dad, you're not to go walking around Trant or on your own from now on. Selden frowned. Why? Because of one incident, you have enemies. Enemies? Yes, indeed. Those sewer rats were not after simply anyone. They identified you by calling out psycho history. Why do you suppose that was? I don't know why. Don't you suppose the Trontorians know that their world is going downhill at a rapid rate? Don't you suppose they know that your psycho history has been predicting this for years? Doesn't it occur to you that they may blame the messenger for the message? I can't believe that. You have to. You can't go out alone. I'll have to be with you, or you will have to have bodyguards. That's the way it's going to be, Dad. Selden looked dreadfully unhappy. Rage softened. But not for long, Dad. I've got a new job. Selden looked up. A new job? What kind? Teaching. At a university. Which university? Santani. Selden's lips trembled. Santani? That's nine thousand parsecs away from Trantor. It's on the other side of the galaxy. Exactly. That's why I want to go there. There's no world in all the Empire that's deteriorating the way Trantor is. Santani, on the other hand, is a decent world, still humming along. And I want to be there to build a new life, along with Manella and Wanda and Bellis. We're all going there in two months. All of you. And you, Dad. You're coming with us to Santani. Selden shook his head. Are you asking me to abandon my life's work? Take psychohistory with you. Start it again on Santani. And the men and women who have been working for me so faithfully. Dad, they've been leaving you because you can't pay them. I have no intention of leaving Trantor. Rach shook his head. 
I was sure you'd be stubborn, Dad. You've got two months to change your mind. Think about it, will you? It had been a long time since Harry Selden had smiled. He had conducted the project in the same fashion that he always did, but he did not smile. All he did was force himself through his work without any feeling of impending success. Rather, there was a feeling of impending failure about everything. And now, as he sat in his office at Streeling University, Wanda entered. Selden gazed at her, framed in his office doorway, and he felt as if his heart would break. Selden was positive that his granddaughter possessed mental abilities far beyond those of average humans, and he was just as sure that there were other like her in the galaxy, on Trantor even. The potential for such greatness all centered on his beautiful granddaughter, and in a few days she would be gone. How could he bear it? She was such a beautiful girl. Eighteen years old, she had long blonde hair, a slightly broad face, and a tendency to smile. She was even smiling now, and Selden thought, why not? She's heading for Santani and for a new life. Well, Wanda, just a few more days. No, I don't think so, Grandpa. He stared at her. What? Wanda approached him and put her arms around him. I'm not going to Santani. Have your father and mother changed their minds? No, they're going. And you're not. Why? I'm going to stay here, Grandpa, with you. She hugged him. Poor Grandpa. But I don't understand. Why? Selden wanted to rejoice, but he couldn't do so openly. There were Rach and Manella. What of them? Wanda, what about your parents? Can you be so cold-blooded about them? I'm not cold-blooded. They understand. They realize I must be with you. Well, how did you manage that? I pushed, and eventually they came to see it my way. You can do that. It wasn't easy. And you did it because... Selden paused. Because I love you, of course. And because... Yes. I must learn psychohistory. I want to learn all I can, so I can carry on when... Well, that would be wonderful, if you could do it. But there is no funding anymore. I'll teach you all I can, but we can't do anything. We'll see, Grandpa. We'll see. Rach, Manella, and little Bellis were waiting at the spaceport. The hypership was preparing for liftoff, and the three had already checked their baggage. Dad, come along with us, Selden shook his head. I cannot. If you change your mind, we will always have a place for you. I know, Rach. Doors and I were lucky to find you. I'm the lucky one. Rach's eyes filled with tears. Selden looked away miserably. Wanda was playing with Bellis when the call rang out for everyone to board the hypership. They did, after a tearful last embrace of Wanda by her parents. Rach looked back to wave at Selden. Selden waved, and one hand moved out blindly to embrace Wanda's shoulders. Now, she was the only one left. Selden and Wanda, having spent a week in a concentrated effort to raise more credits for the psychohistory project, compared notes in Harry's office. Wanda's eyes were filled with tears, but the emotion they represented was not sorrow, but fury. Grandpa, I don't understand it. I simply don't understand it. We've been to four different firms. Each one was ruder and nastier to us than the one before. The fourth one just kicked us out. And since then, no one will let us in. It's no mystery, Wanda. I imagine the word went out as to what we wanted. And now, people won't receive us at all. Why should they? They're not going to give us the credits we need. So why waste time with us? Wanda's anger turned on herself. What did I do? I just sat there. Nothing. Now, I wouldn't say that. 
Bindrus was affected by you. It seems to me that he really wanted to give me credits, largely because of you. You were pushing him and accomplishing something. Not nearly enough. So what do we do now, Grandpa? After all these years, psychohistory will collapse. Selden shook his head. I'll try to keep it from doing so, but I must admit that I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to practice. There must be some way I can strengthen my push. I do wish you could manage to. What are you going to do, Grandpa? Well, nothing much. Two days ago, when I was on my way to see the chief librarian, I encountered three men in the library who were arguing about psychohistory. For some reason, one of them impressed me very much. I urged him to come see me, and he agreed. The appointment is for this afternoon at my office. Are you going to have him work for you? I would like to, if I have enough credits to pay him with. But it can't hurt to talk with him. After all, what can I lose? The young man arrived at precisely four Trantorian Standard Time, and Selden smiled. He loved punctual people. He made ready to heave to his feet, but the young man said, Please, Professor, I know you have a bad leg. You needn't stand up. Thank you, young man. However, that does not mean that you cannot sit down. Please, do. You must forgive me. When we met and set up this appointment, I neglected to learn your name, which is Stettin Palver. Ah, Palver. Palver. The name sounds familiar. It should, Professor. My grandfather boasted frequently of having known you. Your grandfather? Of course, Jeramus Palver. I tried to get him to join me in psychohistory, but he refused. He said that there was no chance of his ever learning enough mathematics to make it possible. Too bad. How is Jeramus, by the way? I'm afraid he's dead. Selden winced two years younger than he himself was, and dead. He regretted that he had lost touch with his old friend. Selden sat there for a while and finally muttered, I'm sorry. The young man shrugged. He had a good life. And you, young man, where did you have your schooling? Langano University. Selden frowned. Langano? That's not on Trantor, is it? No. I wanted to try a different world. And what did you study? Oh, nothing much. History. Not the sort of thing that would lead to a good job. Another wince. Doris Venopoli had been a historian. But you're back here on Trantor. Why is that? Credits. Jobs. As a historian, Palver laughed. Not a chance. I run a device that pulls and hauls. Not exactly a professional occupation. Selden looked at Palver with a twinge of envy. Selden himself had never been quite that muscular. Selden said, I presume that when you were at the university, you were on the boxing team. Who? Me? Never. I'm a twister. A twister? Selden's spirits jumped. Are you from Helicon? Palver said with a certain contempt. You don't have to come from Helicon to be a good twister. No, thought Selden but that's where the best ones come from. However, he said nothing. He did say, though, Well, your grandfather would not join me. How about you? Psychohistory. I heard you talking to the others when I first encountered you, and it seemed to me that you were talking quite intelligently about psychohistory. Would you like to join me, then? As I said, Professor, I have a job. Pushing and hauling. Come, come. It pays well. Credits aren't everything. They're quite a bit. Now you, on the other hand, can't pay me much. Why do you say that? I'm guessing, in a way, I suppose. But am I wrong? Selden's lips pressed together hard. No, you're not wrong, and I can't pay you much. I'm sorry. I suppose that ends our little interview. Wait, wait, wait. Palver held up his hands. Not quite so fast, please. If I work for you, I will be taught psychohistory, right? Of course. In that case, I'll make you a deal. You teach me all the psychohistory you can, 
and you pay me whatever you can, and I'll get by somehow. How about it? Wonderful! Selden was joyous. That sounds great. Now, one more thing. Oh, yes, I've been attacked in recent weeks. My son came to my defence, but he has since gone to Santani. I want you to be my bodyguard. You're a twister. You're exactly what I need. I suppose it can be managed. Palver smiled. See there, Stetton," Selden said as the two were taking an early evening stroll in one of Trantor's residential sectors near Streeling. The older man pointed to debris strewn along the walkway. In the old days, you would never see litter like this. Trantor was our home. We took pride in it. Now, Selden shook his head sadly, resignedly, and sighed. It's. He broke off abruptly. You there, young man! Selden shouted at an ill-kempt fellow who had passed them. He was munching a treat. The wrapper had been tossed to the ground. Pick that up and dispose of it properly, Selden admonished as the young man eyed him sullenly. Pick it up yourself, the boy snarled, and then he walked away. It's another sign of society's breakdown, as predicted by your psychohistory, Professor Selden. Palver said. Yes, Stetton. All around us, the empire is falling apart, piece by piece. In fact, it's already smashed. Here, Selden broke off at the sight of Palver's face. It was as if Palver were straining to hear some sound inaudible to everyone but himself. Suddenly, with an urgent glance around them, Palver took hold of Selden's arm. Harry, quick! We must get away. They're coming. And then the still evening was broken by the harsh sound of rapidly approaching footsteps. Selden and Palver spun around, but it was too late. A band of attackers was upon them. This time, however, Harry Selden was prepared. He immediately swung his cane in a wide arc around Palver and himself. At this, the three attackers—two boys and a girl, all teenage ruffians—laughed. So you're not going to make it easy, are you, old man? Snorted the boy who appeared to be the group's ringleader. Why we'll take you out in two seconds flat? We all of a sudden the ringleader was down, the victim of a perfectly placed twist kick to his abdomen. The other two ruffians quickly dropped to a crouch in preparation for attack, but Palver was quicker. They too were felled almost before they knew what hit them, and then it was over. Come on, let's get out of here quickly," Palver urged. Only this time, it was not the attackers they would be fleeing. Staten, we can't leave," protested Selden. He gestured toward the unconscious would-be muggers. They may be dying. How can we just walk away? It's inhumane. That's what it is. And humanity is exactly what I've been working all these years to protect. Nonsense. What's inhumane is the way muggers like that prey on innocent citizens like you. They'll come to soon enough and slink away to lick their wounds. Harry, you must think. You stand to lose everything if you're linked to another beating. Please, Harry, we must run. With this, Palver grabbed Selden's arm, and Selden, after a last backward glance, allowed himself to be led away. As the footsteps of the rapidly departing Selden and Palver diminished, another figure emerged from his hiding place behind some trees. Chuckling to himself, the sullen-eyed youth muttered, "You're a fine one to tell me what's right and what's wrong, Professor." With that, he spun on his heel and headed off to summon the security officers. Order! I will have order! Bellowed Judge Tehan Popchens Lee, the public hearing of Harry Selden and his young associate Stetton Palver. Had generated a hue and cry among the populace of Trantor. The judge pressed a contact, and a gong resounded throughout the packed courtroom. I will have order, she repeated to the now hushed throng. The judge cut an imposing figure in her scarlet robe. Originally from the outer world of Listina, Liz's appearance had a slight bluish cast. She had a reputation for coming down hard on offenders. I have heard of you, Professor Selden, and your theories about our imminent destruction. You claim to be the victim of assault. 
Your reasoning stems, I believe, from a previously unreported incident in which you and your son allegedly were assaulted by eight hoodlums. However, your plea of self-defense in this case will have to be very convincing. The three hoodlums who were bringing charges against Selden and Palver snickered in their seats at the plaintiff's table. Selden's lawyer, Siv Novker, approached the bench. Your Honor, my client is an upstanding member of the Trontorian community. He is a former first minister of stellar repute. He is a personal acquaintance of our emperor, Aegis the Fourteenth. What possible benefit could Professor Selden derive from attacking innocent young people? Judge Legg glanced down at Selden, clearly unimpressed. What benefit indeed, Counselor? I have been asking myself that very question, and then it dawned on me. Perhaps in his frustration at not being believed, Professor Selden believes he must prove to the world that his predictions of doom and gloom are really coming to pass. After all, here is a man who has spent his entire career foretelling the fall of the Empire, and all he can really point to are a few burned-out bulbs in the dome. A budget cut here and there, nothing very dramatic, but an attack, or two or three, now. That would be something. Le sat back and folded her hands in front of her, a satisfied expression on her face. With great effort, Selden approached the bench, waving off his lawyer, walking headlong into the steely gaze of the judge. Your Honor, please permit me to say a few words in my defense. Of course, Professor Selden. I am most interested to hear what you have to say. Selden cleared his throat before beginning. <coughs> I have <coughs> devoted my life to the Empire, my science of psychohistory, rather than being a harbinger of destruction, is intended to be used as an agent for rejuvenation. I love our worlds, our peoples, our empire. What would it behoove me to contribute to the lawlessness that saps its strength daily? I can say no more. You must believe me. I am speaking from my heart. Selden turned and made his way slowly back to his chair beside Palver. From the heart or not, Professor Selden, this decision will require much thought on my part. Now, I would like to hear from Rael Nivas, who has come forward as an eyewitness to this incident. As Nivas approached the bench, Selden and Palver looked at each other in alarm. It was the boy whom Harry had admonished just before the attack. Would you describe, Mr. Nivas, exactly what you witnessed on the night in question? Nivas fixed Selden with his sullen stare. Well, I was walking along, minding my own business, when I saw those two. He turned and pointed at Selden and Palver on the other side of the walkway, coming toward me. And then I saw those three kids. The two older guys were walking behind the kids. Then, wham, just like that, that old guy swings at him with his stick, and then the younger guy jumps him and kicks him, and before you know it, they're all down on the ground. Then the old guy and his pal, they just took off, just like that. I couldn't believe it. That's a lie, Selden exploded. Young man, you're playing with our lives here. Nivas only stared back at Selden impassively. Judge, Selden implored, can't you see that he is lying? I remember this fellow. I scolded him for littering just minutes before we were attacked. Enough? Professor Selden commanded the judge. Another outburst like that, and I will have you ejected from this courtroom. Now, Mr. Nivas, she said, turning back to the witness, what did you do throughout the sequence of events you just described? Well, I was afraid they'd come after me if they saw me, so I hid. And when they were gone, well, I ran and called the security officers. Nivas had started to sweat and he inserted a finger into the constricting collar of his uni-suit. 
He tried to avoid looking into the audience, but each time he did, he found himself drawn to the steady gaze of a pretty blonde girl sitting in the front row. Mr. Nevas, what do you have to say about Professor Selden's allegation that he and Mr. Palver did see you prior to the attack? Well, uh, no. You see, it was just like I said. I was walking along and... And now Nevas looked over at Selden's table. Selden's companion, Stetton Palver, turned a fierce gaze on Nevas, and Nevas jumped, startled, at the words he heard. Tell the truth. It was as if Palver had spoken, but Palver's lips hadn't moved. Nevas snapped his head in the direction of the blonde girl. He thought he heard her speak. Tell the truth. But her lips were immobile as well. Mr. Nevas... Mr. Nevas, the judge's voice broke in on the youth's jumbled thoughts. Nevas glanced around the courtroom wildly. He couldn't seem to escape the eyes, all the eyes screaming at him to tell the truth. Looking over at Harry Selden, Rial Nevas said simply, I'm sorry. And to the amazement of the entire courtroom assemblage, the fourteen-year-old boy started to cry. It was a lovely day, neither too warm nor too cold. Even though the groundskeeping budget had given out years ago, the few straggly perennials lining the steps leading up to the Galactic Library managed to add a cheerful note to the morning. Selden had high hopes for the day. Since he and Stetton Palver had been cleared of all charges in their most recent assault and battery case, Harry Selden felt like a new man. As Selden slid up the entrance glide rail, he reflected on the current status of his psychohistory project. His good friend, the former chief librarian, Las Zinau, had retired. But, he had assured Selden, the affable new chief librarian, Trima Acarnio, was as progressive as he himself. And so today, Harry Selden was to have his first official meeting with the new chief librarian. He was looking forward to sharing his plans for the future of the project and the encyclopedia. Trima Ancarnio stood as Harry Selden entered the chief librarian's office. Well, well, Professor Selden, come in, sit down. It was, I felt, quite fortuitous that you requested this meeting. You see, I had intended to get in touch with you as soon as I settled in. Selden nodded, pleased. But first, Professor, please let me know why you wanted to see me before we move on to my most likely more prosaic concerns. <laughs> 